Okay, so I guess we're ready to get started. Everybody's muted. Um, so I just want to say welcome, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Lisa Schwartz, and I would like to welcome everyone this morning to our platform, members and non-members, visitors alike. Um, you know, as we just said, it's been a really, really rough week. Um, and I just want to start by, by saying that um, throughout this four years, I think we've known how important community is, how important it is to be among friendly faces and like-minded individuals to get support. It's really been important for, this, for these four years. And now after Wednesday, um, just, you know, I feel it more, more than ever that um, I'm so grateful for this community, grateful for my community of friends and, um, and so having said that, I just want to welcome everybody here today. And if you feel like talking after the platform, it will be just, just a discussion. Nothing's off the table to talk about your feelings um, about this past week. Feel free to stay on immediately after, after platform. We will be recording the platform address today, uh, including the question and answer period. Uh, it will be posted on Facebook, on our website, and on YouTube. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with ethical culture, we are a humanist congregational movement about 150 years old. We're dedicated to exploring the ways in which we can live meaningful and ethical lives. Unlike traditional religious groups, we have no supernatural component to our services. But that said, there's no requirement of belief or non-belief. That's something that's between you and your conscience. Our motto is deed before creed. We believe that how one acts in life is more important than any creed that one espouses. We believe in the dignity and worth of every human being. And we believe in taking action when we witness injustices that occur against others. Our speaker this morning is someone um, whom Ron and I had the great pleasure to get to know through working for her when she ran. Thank you, Artie, for running. As Ron told you, we feel it was a very courageous thing to do. And you know, we're so happy that we got to know Artie Krybik. Um, she will be, be our speaker today. And I'll be introducing her a little more fully later. Um, but first, today we do have music and I will turn it over to someone I know very well, um, Ron Schwartz, who will introduce the music. <laughs> Ron. Hi, everybody. I also want to welcome everybody as co-chair of the membership committee. Eddie Gross and I welcome everybody here. And uh, I think that the events of this last week have shown uh, how so important it is to be part of a community that wants to move this country forward rather than move this country backward. So if you're interested in becoming a member or learning more about the Ethical Culture Society, talk to either me or Eddie Gross. As far as the music uh, goes, uh, Lenny Goldstein and I are so happy to be doing the music uh, for this platform when we have an incredibly courageous um, person speaking today who took her beliefs and did more than just believe them, she put them on the line, she put herself on the line and ran for office. And I'm so happy to be and pleased to be doing the music for her today. Now, if anything that we've learned from the last four years and especially the last week and especially Wednesday, how important it is to put our beliefs into action and to be ever, ever vigilant to protect our democracy because our democracy is threatened when citizens don't become active in that democracy. And we have to do it now, we can't wait. We have one life and we have to make use out of that life to make things a better place while we're here. Phil Oakes said this back in 1966 when he wrote a song called, When I'm Here. And Lenny and I are gonna be bringing this to you now. Mm. 
there's no place in this world where I'll be long when I'm gone. I won't know the right from the wrong when I'm gone. You won't find me singing on this song when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. I won't feel the flowing of the time when I'm gone. All the pleasures of love will not be mine when I'm gone. My pen can't pour the lyric line when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. I won't be breathing the brandy air when I'm gone. I can't even worry about my cares when I'm gone. I won't be asked to do my share when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here And I won't be running from the rain when I'm gone And I can't even suffer from my pain when I'm gone I can't say who's to praise and who's to blame when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here And I won't feel the warming of the sun When I'm gone All the evenings and my mornings will be one When I'm gone Can't be singing louder than the guns When I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it While I'm here days won't be dances of delight when I'm gone and the sands will be shifting from my sight when I'm gone can't add my name down into the fight when I'm gone so I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here I won't be laughing at all the lies when I'm gone I can't question how or when or why when I'm gone. I can't live proud enough to die when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. Let's slow it down. There's no place in this world where I'll be long when I'm gone. And I won't know the right from the wrong when I'm gone. You won't find me singing on this song when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it I guess I'll have to do it I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here Thanks, everybody. Okay, wow. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Lenny. I, I'm a little choked up. I can never hear that song and most of Phil Oak's songs without just hearing up. That one in particular is so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Ron and Lenny. So now it's my pleasure to, um, an honor, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Artie Krybik. Um, I'll say a little bit about Artie before she talks. Um, Artie, Dr. Krybik, is a neuroscientist She's a Glen Rock council member, a mom, and a grassroots organizer, who many of you may know, and some of you worked on her campaign. Artie ran for Congress in the 2020 Democratic primary against incumbent Josh Gottheimer. Dr. Krybik was compelled to run for Congress because the crisis we face requires bold, progressive leadership that prioritizes people and the planet. This certainly took courage, Artie, to put yourself out there and run for office because you want to make a difference. I think we all can agree that Artie and I sure know embodies our humanist values. Today, Dr. Krybik will talk about what she learned from the experience, some of the challenges she faced, 
and any unexpected surprises she encountered along the way. It is now my pleasure and my honor to introduce Dr. Arti Krivik. Thanks, Arti. You're on, you can unmute. Thank you so much. And I will go ahead and tell you that this is the first meeting I'm on that I'm already crying. So thank you. <laughs> it's uh, amazing and beautiful. And I really am um, so honored to be part of this community. Um, so I'm not actually really crying, but I am almost there. Um, I'm having a hard time. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I'm having a really hard time thinking about how I should talk about my run, you know, and the kinds of things that I would love to have told you a week ago because of everything that's happening right now. And so I've been thinking about this. I wrote, I rewrote, I uh, talked to my husband <laughs> before he had to run out of here for work. Um, and we've just been processing, right? We've just been processing the kinds of things that we that have happened over four years, over the four, last four days, <laughs> over 40 decades and 400 years. And I realized as I was processing this, as I continue to process this, um, that it's all part of the bigger whole, right? It's all part of this bigger process about why I felt compelled. And it really was compelled to run for Congress. Why I really felt as if I needed to be one of the ordinary people, ordinary people who stood up and said enough is enough. Who stood up and said, we need to do more. We cannot just sit and wait for somebody else to get up and do something. So this, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that this is not going to be a polished talk. This is going to come from my heart. And this is going to be fairly extemporaneous. Um, and having started down this lovely um, emotional roller coaster, Ron, <laughs> Um, it's probably going to uh, go down that road as well. But I will just tell you, about a year ago, uh, a year minus about two weeks, um, it was my birthday and I was at this big birthday party, uh, probably the biggest birthday party I've ever had. And I remember distinctly saying um, that there are very few times, very few times in your life where you feel as if you are in the exact right place to do the right thing for the right reasons and that you might be the right person. And you're not sure, but you might be the right person to be doing this. And a year later, I feel exactly the same way about my campaign. I was in the right place to be able to do the right thing for the right reasons. But it wasn't just about me, right? It wasn't just about me being the right person. It was about everybody who came together being the right people. And the thing is, it wasn't just about that one moment where I said, this is what I wanted to do. Uh, it's really about the small moments that we all have every single day where we take those decisions that add up to that bigger decision for making sure the right kind of change happens. And I will just say that more than anything that has been the biggest lesson through especially my activism of the last four years um, and, and my run for Congress, it's up to every single one of us it's up to every small thing that we do and a few big things that end up happening because of it. It's because we stand up and we comment on a blatant Facebook post or a social media tweet, right? It's because we stand up 
And we make sure that misinformation doesn't go farther. It's because we stand up and we speak out about systemic racism. It's because those of us who have any kind of power stand up and not only say Black Lives Matter, but really talk about what that white supremacy looks like in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our schools, in our interactions, right? And at the end of the day, I think it's all of those things where then we ask our demand that our representatives who claim to have the same values as we do, stand up and actually act on those values. Not just act on them, but lead on them. And that means not leading from behind. And that means not asking constituents to call and say, hey, do you believe the election actually is legitimate? It's standing on what the truth is, and it's making sure that people understand what that truth is. And now more than ever, we need that in this, what they're calling post-truth, which is really a pretty fascist moment in our American democracy. And we need that for every single one of us, no matter where we are in life. So thinking about running for Congress, thinking about the kinds of things that I learned, I learned a lot about power. I learned a lot about institutional power, about systemic power, and I continue to learn about this. I learned that even those in power who are part of your own party will absolutely stop any kind of change. I learned that systemic and institutional power just fights against change. And make no mistake, this is not inertia. It's also a deliberate attempt to keep out those that threaten the status quo, whether the status quo is right or not. So let me say it again. It's a deliberate attempt to keep out everyone who threatens the status quo, no matter if you share those values or not. And at the end of the way, it is about preserving the power that they have for themselves. I learned a lot about what people say they support and what they actually support. I learned a lot about the power of the purse. And while before I ran for Congress, I was for public funding of elections, I learned just how deeply we need reform. I learned how much there is to do and how much misinformation that there is out there about what campaign finance really looks like. And what a stranglehold corporate PAC donations and corporations have on our electoral system and our, and our basis of government. You know, we, we know this, we see this, we've learned a lot about this, uh, but the fact that it actually affects every single decision, whether it's big or small, and particularly those small insidious decisions um, at all levels, from the local to the state to the federal government, it, it is something that it, it's, it's beyond where we need to be um, in our society. So I learned about the power of the purse. Um, but I also learned, and the thing that I carry with me all the time, um, is the power of the people, really, at the end of the day. I learned about what it means to have a sisterhood <laughs> a true sisterhood, right? I learned about what it means to have a community of supporters who believe in all the things that you do, who believe in doing the right thing. I learned how much power there is in that. Um, I learned about the power of the youth, uh, the young people. And I learned about how much anger that they have. And at the end of the day, I think what I learned about was 
no matter who we are, right? no matter where we come from, no matter you know, where we think we're going, we can either be held down by fear. And that is the tool that systems and institutions use to make sure that we have status quo and, and status quo remains. So we can either be held down by fear or we can really work towards the kinds of things that we really want to happen and be buoyed by optimism. And when I'm talking about optimism and when I'm talking about hope, I am not talking about the sort of, you know, fluffy kind of positivity, right? I'm not talking about um, just lip service and saying that things are going to be okay. I'm talking about the hard work that we need to do. I'm talking about the uncomfortable conversations that we need to have. I'm talking about all that internal work that we need to do. I'm talking about being uncomfortable so that we can actually push that agenda for the kinds of things that we do. And I did that. I will say every single day of the campaign. Um, and what I'm committed to doing is to make sure I do that every single day, no matter if I'm running or not. And I think I, more than anything, have been inspired by the folks who've come together for this campaign. I mean, make no mistakes, we, we, we were a scrappy campaign. And I, and I say that proudly, right? Uh, we were a spra scrappy campaign of volunteers who, really believed that we might be able to make a difference. We might be able to win, but even if it didn't win, we would be able to make a big difference. We succeeded. We succeeded in that. So while the campaign, while I didn't win the election, while, while we didn't win the election, um, we put together this incredible coalition of national progressive groups, of groups across North Jersey, across Jersey, um, with folks who were veterans, with um, folks who um, care about the environment, who care about healthcare, um, all the kinds of different groups came together to form really a coalition and to unite to demand better for everyone. And that really in this particular way has never happened before. You know, we had as a primary challenger that fundraise less than 10% of what the incumbent had, we were able to get 34, almost 34% of the total vote. That is powerful given the fact that we have something called the line in New Jersey given the fact that having that institutional bulwark against any change um, really confers something like a 50 to 60% um, uh, advantage to the incumbency and really prevents anybody from having any kind of change, particularly in the primary system. So the fact that we did that, the fact that we have thousands of volunteers who came out and the fact that we did that in the middle of a pandemic where frankly, we couldn't go out and knock on doors, um, really shows the kind of hunger there is, the kind of hope that people are willing to work towards, um, and the kind of America, right? The kind of government that we all want to bring. So that gives me a lot of hope. So, I would love to tell you, I'd love for this to be more interactive and I'm happy to talk about sort of all the different kinds of experiences I have. But I will just tell you that running for Congress, uh, candidly, was difficult. I, there were lots of low moments, um, low moments that I did not imagine that I was gonna have, moments of loneliness in a way that I would not have predicted, but it was incredibly uplifting. It was, um, it had such highs, the, the feeling of community, the feeling of support, of understanding that what we were doing was bigger than each one of us individually was incredible and amazing. And for everything that we all did together and for all of all of the roadblocks and challenges that we had, including not knowing, you know, especially early on, whether this was even a viable campaign, whether, you know, I was going out there, we were going out there and not having any impact at all. 
even within that uncertainty, the fact that we all came together, all of the positives have exponentially, exponentially been better than all of the negatives that we've had, you know, during the course of the campaign and then. Um, and I really never perceived that the campaign would be the kind of movement um, that it became. I am being incredibly honored, just beyond honored to have had this experience. And I know and I understand how deeply privileged that I was, that I am to have been able to have this experience. Uh, and you know, while it's very kind, very kind um, to call me courageous, uh, it's not accurate. <laughs> it really isn't. Um, I was able to do the kinds of things I was able to do because of the incredible amount of support I had, because I knew that I could look towards my family, my friends, my sisterhood who buoyed me up the entire time. And I am getting very emotional because it is that community that we need now more than ever. Um, as we all as we all stand together as bulwarks against the kind of fascism that we are seeing out there. So for me, I really don't consider what I did to be courageous. I consider what I did to be necessary. And every single day, every single one of us has that choice to do what's necessary and to do the right thing. And I think what this group does, and I think that what we all need to do is just to find what's necessary. That's it. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. If you'll give me two seconds to, you know, mop up my face. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna unmute myself and move from here. Thank you, Artie. Um, I, and I will apologize in advance uh, because this really just continues to be a very emotional day uh, and very emotional week for me. Uh, not the least because um, it, my, uh, Wednesday was my last day as uh, being a council member. So I will have to correct you, Lisa. I am a former council member of Glen Rock. <laughs> so uh, 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 oh, 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 I didn't I knew you were resigning. I didn't realize it was Wednesday. It was Wednesday. Well, I didn't resign. It was my term was at the end. Oh, uh, yeah. what a rough day for you. Oh, it was beautiful. Personally, I'm sure. It, yes, it was, it was, it was a, it's been a challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're going to be missed. I mean, Artie has done some great things on the Glen Rock Council. I mean, I don't know how many of you know one of the things I know you did were you first, first, I think we're the first, I don't know if we're the only town yet in Bergen yeah. County that now has banned um, plastic bags and all supermarkets, correct, and stores. And we were one of the first, but Ridgewood's done the same thing and a bunch of other um, towns have done that. And we were the first, and I think still the only town in Glen Rock, um, in Bergen County that has 100% uh, renewable energy, um, the renew renewable energy uh, market for our residents. And then we're gonna re-up with that in March or April um, with a bigger consortium. So, so the kinds of things that all municipal, all local governments can actually do right. to create real change. Yeah, yeah. I want to say to that, just to speak to that, I, I'm not, I don't wanna take up too much time on this issue, but, um, but you know, RT, you've been a leader. You've been a leader in this county, in this community. It's been an honor to get to know you. I just wanna to say to our congregation, you know, it's been a real tough four years. It's been a tough, as you said, it's not just four years, it goes back a whole lot longer than that. Um, but one of the things for me was working on your campaign. And I've told people this so much. It's, um, I fight for my grandkids. I fight for the younger generation. And when you talk about the anger that you saw, all these beautiful young interns that you had working for you, um, I got to meet a lot of them. And they just filled me with hope. Um, and I, I repeated this continuously to people, you know, um, there's so much energy out there um, from, from young people, from the people who are heading up these progressive groups, working hard. Um, and that gives me so much hope for the future. And you did that for us, you know, with, through your campaign, we got to meet these people and you've been such an inspiration. So I just want to thank you. And I don't care what you say, I do think you're courageous. Um, 
So um, anyway, um, with that, um, I will turn it over to our question and answer period, because I know people will have, um, have questions for you. Um, I do yeah. ask that everybody be mindful of how long that, you know, give, give it one minute, please try to limit it to um, questions and not statements um, so that everybody has a chance to ask. So I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Lenny to recognize people. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the first person with their hand raised is my lovely wife, Allison. So go ahead, Al. Uh, good morning, RT. I love a woman with heart and you sure have heart. You touched my, my heart this morning. Um, I had uh, three thoughts that I wanted to share and they're not necessarily connected. One is when Gottheimer defeated Scott Garrett, I remember being swelled with a sense of pride being that he was Jewish. I realized that's just one aspect of a candidate, but I felt a certain sense of pride that we had the same heritage. I also was delighted to see that he uh, was pro-choice as I am fervently. And um, so that's sort of where my perspective was coming into the discussion today. Um, I wondered what, oh, by the way, I just wanted to put in a little pitch for Glenrock, having taught a summer art program there. They're doing an amazing job in raising their children in Glenrock. Just need to say that. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, what do you think of the Promise Keepers Caucus that Gosh Gottheimer found? I believe he was a founding member. Does that give you any optimism? Oh, oh okay. Allison, thank you so much uh, for all of those comments, including you know all the hometown pride that I get to have, although I will say that our kids are just as nice across Bergen County. Um, uh, so, so there's a lot there. So I'm gonna start off by saying a couple of things. When Josh won, I was happy, right? And, and I've said this during my campaign, I'll say it here again. He was the first non-presidential lawn sign I ever had, you know, on my lawn, um, you know, because we were working to make sure we flipped. Scott Garrett was awful, nobody, like awful, 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 awful. So when, when Josh won, I was happy. We, we had supported him. We had volunteered for him. I, you know, when he was um, getting ready for re-election, you know, I bought into all of what he was saying, right? Like our NJ5 is so conservative. Look who we had for so long. Pro-choice, of course, that's like incredible. I mean, if it's not, if it's not obvious, it's incredibly important to me, um, you know, as a woman and frankly, as mother of boys, um, you know, I think, that for, for multiple, multiple reasons, it was something that was incredibly important to me. So when he won and when he was going for re-election, um, you know, I, I, I did a whole get out the vote canvas for him. I mean, I think if you Google, you know, my name in his, especially early on, there are lots and lots of pictures um, that, that talk about my support for him, right? Uh, so it's not about that. But I realized as, as things were going forward and, and representation matters. So I understand your pride, right? I completely like representation absolutely matters. We need to feel as if we're representative that we have a core set of values with people who are our representatives. You know, we need to feel that we have that language because when we disagree on things, um, we need to understand, right, where it's coming from. And that is the problem right there. So Josh, who is not a co-founder, but he is one of the co-chairs of the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is what they're called, um, um, has been hugely problematic, right? Because what we want, what we want are people who are gonna stand up for the right things, not people who are going to compromise on human rights and our values, right? Two different things. And I understand that politics is the art of compromise. Trust me, I understand. You cannot be a local council member, especially for three years, um, and not, you know, in in a, in a divided caucus, right? Um, and even if everyone is a, the same party, obviously we have all different uh, places where we come from for particular issues. So you can't learn how to compromise. You can't learn how to get things done um, without having that compromise. So completely there with that, right? The problem is, 
The problem is when you don't stand up for human rights and when you compromise on those lines, there are bright lines you don't cross, right? One of those is even talking about white supremacy. It's talking about Black Lives Matter um, and not just making, you know, mere lip service. And I think this was literally months after the movement happened, um, but it's actually taking real action when it's in your power to do so. It is taking those lumps, right? It is standing up and taking that criticism that comes at you as a leader and then saying, this is why you're wrong. Like, I understand that you think, you know, somehow you have the wrong information about what BLM might be, or you have the wrong information about what, you know, um, somebody who is talking about immigrants might have. But here is what the truth is. And here are the set of values that we are coming towards. Um, and to me, and it still is, is, is the same here, um, if you, those are the lines that you don't cross no matter which party you're from. And if you're really from the Democratic Big Tank Party, then those are baseline values. Um, that's what I expect my representative to have. That's what I have fought for. And that's what you know I wanted to reinforce across the way. Um, and so for me, the fact that he didn't do that was beyond you know what he was talking about, Scott Garrett. It was, it was a matter of values. I will also say that, especially when you look at the numbers, NJ5 is more blue than it ever has been. And we're solidly blue, especially now. Uh, and I knew that going in, which is part of why um, I decided to primary him um, because I knew that especially in 2020, the seat was not going to go towards a Republican. And I knew that this was our chance to have somebody who was solidly um, with the kinds of values that you know we needed um, in here. Um, and I will just tell you straight out because this is not something that I've hidden at all. Um, it is it infuriates me and makes me angry and makes us, should make us all angry that our representative was not the first out of the gate to talk about impeachment then or now. Um, he still hasn't, you know, sorry, said he would sign on to the articles of impeachment after what happened on Wednesday. And we all saw what happened. He was in the middle of this, right? Uh, and to me, that is not leadership. Uh, and those kinds of compromises in the kind of world that we are all living in are not the compromises that our representatives, federal representatives, or local representatives should be making. So. Go ahead, Ron, you're next. Artie, um, you know how I feel about you, so I'll, I'll pass all those, those comments. Um, two questions. There are couple of people on this um, uh, platform today that are active in the Democratic Party, more particularly the, the TDMC, which you're well aware of. Um, I think we'd be interested to know what you think um, are the reforms of the Democratic Party that are necessary at this particular point to make it a more viable and democratic organization. And two, can you discuss now any of your plans for your political future? I think a lot of people might be interested on this on this uh, platform right now to know about that. Well, thank you for that. Um, so the Democratic Party and what we can do right now, uh, one in New Jersey, abolish the line, period. It's our moral imperative to do that. Uh, if we are going to be the party of inclusion, if we're going to be the party of equity, that's what we need to do. Um, and I will just tell you right now, it is not a partisan issue. It is a deeply nonpartisan issue. We have a coalition of folks from the League of Women Voters um, onwards who have signed on to the fact that the line is undemocratic. So for those of you who don't know what the line is, or actually, is there a show of hands? Do people understand what the line is? Shall I do a summary? Okay, great. So I'm just gonna do a short summary. So ballot design in New Jersey sucks. <laughs> for the lack of a better word, right? I mean, it just sucks. Um, it is designed, especially primary ballots are designed to be intentionally confusing. They are designed to make sure that who the county chairs um, really want. And now keep in mind, county chairs are unelected. Not, I'm not talking about county, you know, municipal county committee members who are elected. We're talking about unelected folks, whoever those want. Um, you know, those are the people that are really going to be in a position of, of being favorites on the ballot on the ballot design. Um, so what happens is that you can bracket people and you can actually design the ballot and what we've seen over and over again so that folks feel as if 
you know, there's only one real choice and this is the legitimate choice. Um, I will tell you this, of course, happened with me in this primary, but I had known about the line for, you know, since actually I really started in um, politics about four years ago in New Jersey. Um, and we're relatively new transplant to New Jersey, only nine years. Um, so <laughs> Um, so it was it was a new thing for me. Um, so I will say that um, there are ways of changing our ballot design to make it more democratic. There are 49 other states that do this. It is incredibly undemocratic for us to have the kinds of things that we do um, to ensure that the people in power keep you know, being in power. And I said this during my campaign, it's actually absolutely true. Um, when I talk to normal everyday people in NJ5 across you know, all the counties, they would say to me, why are you running? You are never going to be able to make a difference because both political parties are corrupt and both political parties uh, just wanna keep power for themselves. Um, I will say, I can completely understand why people feel that way because both political parties, once they get into power, do wanna keep the power for themselves, but in a way that is completely undemocratic and in a way that really doesn't actually help any of the people. Um, so if we really want to do what, what, what we say we're going to do, that's, that's the number one thing. You know, it's very interesting as a South Asian woman, as a brown woman in politics who came into this in the post-Trump era, uh, to go from being called a um, star, rising star of the Democratic Party, when I became a Glen Arc council member, the first you know, South Asian council member, first actually non-white council member ever, um, in Glen Rock to um, being a pariah, right? Uh, less than two years later and somebody who doesn't know what she's talking about um, because you know I had the temerity to threaten the status quo um, and that's problematic in and of itself. So I would say that. And the other thing is uh, we should really take a stand against corporate PACs um, and corporate PAC money. If we're gonna put our money where our mouth is, um, we should, um, ensure that our our representatives and folks who are going up there are um, we do real substantive um, things to um, get rid of corporate PACs um, and not just do lip service. Uh, in terms of my plans in the future, um, I don't know. Um, I know that I will continue to fight uh, because I can't not. Um, the same compelling reason why I got into um, running, uh, why I got into activism, why I got into you know, wanting to make a difference as a council member, uh, wanting to do this crazy thing called running for Congress with no political experience um, and all of that um, are still here. Um, I don't know what form they will take. Um, I, I do know that I'm committed to dismantling white supremacy. I'm committed to dismantling systemic racism. I'm committed to that idea uh, that brought me to be a naturalized citizen uh, at 19, um, which is that our government is by the people for the people. Um, so whatever way I can actually make that happen for real um, is what I'll be doing. So, hey, if you have any ideas, throw them my way. <laughs> I have some time coming up. All right, uh, Gwen Levine, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your talk today. I wanted to ask you, Arati, uh, you mentioned that one of the fantastic things about your campaign is these community activist groups that came together uh, that were really terrific in the area. Could you tell us who, who are those people? So if there's some of us who would like to put in some time with an effective community progressive activist group in the area, uh, who would that be? Who were you really impressed with and think are really effective? Oh gosh. Um <laughs> We have a lot of those, um, you know, across the board. I think it just kind of depends on, you know, who and what you're looking for. So let me see if I still even have that in my, so I have a website, artikrybic.com that actually, you know, came over from my um, campaign website. And I think we had a bunch of coalitions there. But for example, so in Glenrock and Ridgewood, we have Ridgewood Jolt. We have, um, obviously in Teaneck, we have Teaneck Women Together. We have um, in the Highlands, um, we have uh, the Highlands Coalition. Uh, we have uh, Moms Demand Action. We have Students Demand Action. We have Our Revolution, of course. Um, uh, you know, we have. Um, uh, there, there's an entire list, and if I can actually find that link, I will send it to you. But if you are honestly interested in particular, you know, uh, I, I can't, of course. Um, 
say enough about Lisa and Ron um, and yeah. write wine and resist mostly because there's wine and resist um, in there. But you know, there are a bunch of um, there are a bunch of um, groups. Um, is there a particular? I'm just actually trying to find it on my website as I'm talking to you, and I don't know if there's a link that is available off of here. But I'm happy to send you a link uh, with those. Uh, and I'm also happy to, um, you know, if you, if there's a particular area or place that you're talking about, you know, I'm, I'm happy to kind of, you know, share some ideas about folks there. Um, I will also say that one of the things that our, that our campaign did was really just sort of bring everyone together on, you know, under that umbrella. So Indivisible NJ5, for God's sakes, I can't really, I'm forgetting this. Um, we brought folks together under that umbrella and that was, you know, really helpful. Um, and we have people who are interested in, in, in many different things. So Food and Water Action, for example, Paula Rogovin, who is a star who I think is on um, today with them. Um, you know, we, we did a lot of things with, um, you know, they, they, they uh, endorsed our campaign, thank goodness. Um, so we worked with them. Uh, we worked with Sunrise um, and Sunrise Hubs across New Jersey. And I think there's a new Sunrise Hub actually happening in Bergen, which is about time. Um, we worked with. Uh, there, there's just there, there. There were so many. I can't list all of them. But honestly, if, if there are particular ones that you would love to know about uh, or areas, um, yeah, drop me an email. It's just uh, I'm just arthikrybic at gmail.com. So. Do you, do you still have a website? Where we I do. It's arthikrybic.com. Okay, good. Uh, there's a question in chat. If um... Yeah, I was going to, I'm just I'm muting myself. Yeah, there was a question in chat. There were two. One was a comment. I'm just looking down. So one of the comments, RT, I don't know, someone was interested in uh, learning more about your professional career. We do know you're a neuroscientist. So if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. And while you're doing that, I'm going to look down to see what the other question was. Sure. Yeah. So I'm trained as a neuroscientist. Um, I... Um, actually got my PhD in um, drugs of abuse and stress. Um, amusingly, two things that are coming back to the fore in multiple other ways these days. Um, uh, from University of Pennsylvania, I did a postdoc work on autism, um, on social behaviors. Um, and then I actually worked for pharma um, for two years as a clinical educator, two different companies, um, realized, um, frankly, why pharma is the way it is, um, you know, understood more deeply why it was not something that I really ever wanted a part of and left. Um, I was working as a research programs director for a nonprofit. Um, and uh, before I, while I was, you know, while I was doing my activism and um, to try and find a cure for, uh, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, and now um, I am actually um, looking to teach and looking to do, you know, I'm not actually doing research at the moment, um, but that has been uh, my career for a very long time. So I've done lots of teaching, <laughs> I've done lots of research. Um, I worked in nonprofit and I've, uh, you know, worked in corporate pharma and, and couldn't get away from that fast enough. Wow. Hmm. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, RT. Yeah. Um, so the question was, um, okay, from Vivian Goldblatt. Um, what do you think society can do to help women get political seats in the United States? It is great that women in the USA got the right to vote 100 years ago. Now we need more women, right? So what can we do? We do. Um, and I will just say that um, while it's incredible that, you know, that we had the 19th Amendment, um, you know, I wouldn't have had the right to vote uh, 100 years ago um, as a non-white person, as a non-white woman, um, depending on, you know, which state I was and, and where it is. Um, so really it's about us all recognizing that intersectionality um, and us all recognizing that that plays a huge role in who is able to be where um, and how in power. Um, I think that's incredible. And this is, you know, I'm going to refer to that privilege that I was talking about. So when I came to this country, you know, we were poor, right? Um, didn't have a lot of resources, but we had a lot of 
privilege um, in retrospect, as it turns out, um, because we were part of, um, essentially I'm part of a model minority, right? So um, there are lots and lots of things that, um, there are lots of doors that are open to me that are not open to um, Latina women, that are not open to black women. Um, and that is a huge um, privilege that I have, even as I fought against the patriarchy, um, you know, frankly, every single day, um, and especially, you know, given the patriarchal society that I come from and the community um, that I come from, that I still fight against, um, you know, all the time. So for me, it is all of us coming together, understanding deeply what that intersectionality means, and making sure that we fight for things in big ways and small. And so here, I'm going to tell you a small way um, that we talk about in some of the big ways, right? So a small way, um, so on my campaign, one of our biggest things um, in my campaign staff and some of our volunteers will tell you, um, I really hate it um, when people say, you guys, I do it too, right? And so it was institutional, like we, we were trying to change the lexicon, right? To make sure that what we meet, what we did was every time correct to somebody when they said guys. Um, and part of it, was really to make sure that we are in a place where we start talking about you know, how much patriarchy inculcates what we talk about and how we actually converse. It's a small thing and you can choose your own you know, hill there. Um, but the big thing is really ensuring that what we're doing is allowing space for women um, to talk and making sure that women in particular amplify each other making sure that when we're in a space, we amplify, and I've made a conscious decision to amplify um, black and brown women, um, make sure that what we're doing is um, being in a sisterhood with each other uh, and make sure what we're doing is promoting each other um, because that's absolutely what's needed, right? Um, and I think that that beyond anything um, does a lot. And then frankly, everyday acts of bravery, everyday acts of um, speaking out um, and doing everything that we can to um, demand better. So um, demand more representation on all different, you know, ev everywhere that we look, right? Whether we're talking about a planning board in your town, um, whether you're talking about the board of education, whether you're talking about, um, you know, where you work, and um, how and why you're holding meetings at what time. Um, you know, all of those small things um, add up to really big things um, that make a difference. And a lot of it is just people are oblivious um, because, and you know, are, are just not understanding um, the, the ways that all of these little things affect us. Um, and I will say a big thing in terms of work is being transparent about salaries. Uh, it's being transparent about how much you get paid um, and when you are um, in a position to put a job offering out there, that salary range needs to be in there because we know already, women already underestimate their abilities as well as what they think they can get. Um, and having that transparency is uh, incredibly important um, because, you know, at the end of the day, when we're looking for equity, um, we're, you know, it comes from making sure that people are fairly compensated. Um, for their time and for their skills. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, so um, Ed, Edward, uh, no, I'm sorry, Jim Norman, please lower your hand and you can unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yep. I can. Okay, good. Um, I'd like to talk a little, bring the talk a little bit back to Artie, to your opponent uh, in this last primary. I noticed a, a day or so ago, our representative uh, reached a hand of reconciliation across the aisle to these people who either, well, to the people who enabled uh, the invaders into the Congress. And I just want to say that that frankly disgusted me. I felt that Reconciliation without laying the groundwork is, is a very bad idea. I think by the groundwork, I mean first truth 
And then accountability, including punishment where appropriate and restoration of the damage done. And then we can get to reconciliation. Uh, there's no shortcut to, to, to true reconciliation. Without laying the groundwork, it seems to me that reconciliation is the equivalent of appeasement. And in an instance like this, appeasement is the equal of treason. And I feel so strongly about this. I just want to want to take a moment to say that I called Gottheimer's office to register my severe disappointment and outrage over this kind of approach at this time. And I want to know how you feel about it and whether you would encourage others to do the same. Uh, I agree with you 100%, Jim. Um, and I absolutely encourage all of us um, to make sure that we don't rush to this reconciliation language that folks are using, this um, false unity, right? Um, yeah. that, that is being touted, uh, you know, really left and right. And I mean that both politically as well as, you know, ubiquitously here. Um, it's, it's um, but to me, the thing that makes me very sad and angry, um, there's a lot of anger, especially over the last four years, um, that makes me really sad and angry is that we have a Democratic Congress member to whom we have to appeal and say, what you're doing is appeasement. What you're doing is false what you're doing is encouraging sedition. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, how we can still have that happen and not be ashamed. Um, and, and, you know, I've been very candid about this. I am ashamed. We should not, this should not be the case that we have. Um, we, we should not have any representative, whether you are a Democrat or a Republican, um, but especially if you're a Democrat um, who is out there with language of, um, you know, let, let's sweep this under the carpet, let's blow this over, um, you know, similar to what Lindsey Graham is saying, um, similar to what, you know, Mitch McConnell is saying, similar to what Trump essentially wants at the end of the day. Um, and that is indicative not of any real um, philosophy where you want people to come together. Um, but really it's indicative of ensuring that we keep upholding white supremacy and we keep making certain people, people in power, um, comfortable. That's the antithesis of where we are and where we should be going. Um, and that's the antithesis of what we can do to save American democracy. Because what's going to happen, right, what's going to happen when we do that um, is that the lies that the election is stolen Right, that um, the the right wingers that um, you know conservative Trump supporters are saying are going to continue to proliferate. So in two years and in four years, what we're going to happen is have this divide that we have that gets bigger and bigger, um, and we have conditions that are rife for um, a greater um, a top, basically greater fascism um, than than what we have right now. Um, and so to me, it is truly dangerous to give that kind of, um, to, to have that kind of appeasement because at the end of the day, it's, it's going to crumble our democracy. And this is not about um, being antagonistic. This is about protecting our form of government. And this is about protecting the truth, so. So would you recommend that we call Gottheimer's office and flood him with our, or our, our perspectives? I absolutely 100% recommend that. Um, and I represent <laughs> letters and I, rec I recommend uh, uh, letters to the editor. I recommend uh, talking to the press. I recommend making as much noise as possible um, around this. And Thank I you. will also say that when this finally happens, um, because it will, <laughs> especially with the amount of, you know, uh, amount of support and amount of, I think, hopefully um, the kind of, um, the kind of support that we're seeing um, to make sure that we, you know, we, we basically punish people um, the ways that they need to punish. Um, let's be let's be sure that when we're thanking people, <laughs> that we're thanking them with the full understanding of how much effort it took for them to get there. Um, and let's be sure 
that when we are talking about folks doing the right thing, we also ensure that they do they continue to do the right thing without us um, you know having to be vigilant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Edward, you can unmute yourself. You're next. Is it left next? Yeah, he did. He's unmuted. Okay. Um, uh, given all the inherent uh, impediments you've found in running uh, as a non incumbent within your own party, uh, do you feel that the concept of ranked choice voting may have uh, some value? both in primaries and in general elections in New Jersey, as um, sometimes the reduction of political uh, values and uh, expression to simply two uh, legitimized parties, it really constrains democracy and the expression of uh, you know, a range of uh, expressions that, that are useful in society. Uh, I've been a supporter of ranked choice voting actually before I started running in a primary. Uh, I'm a bigger supporter now, um, you know, than I was then. Um, but we really do need to make sure that that's coupled with a good ballot design and abolishing the line because, you know, none of it's going to work if the ballot that you get is confusing, if the ballot that you get um, really just indicates that one person is the right choice, um, the legitimate choice, the choice of, you know, um, the only choice that you can go. And I will just anecdotal, anecdotally tell you this. Um, so, so the answer to your question is yes, but it needs to be coupled with a couple of the reforms, including particularly ballot design. Um, and anecdotally, I will tell you that they, uh, after the primary, um, I had supporters, um, you know, a couple of them were older, not all of them, um, a couple of them were also quite young, who, you know, who said, oh, you know, we wanted to vote for you, but we couldn't find you on the ballot. Or we wanted to vote for you, but it was really weird that you were in this other column and column three. And by the way, that was actually fairly good uh, compared to what they, where they could have put me. Um, and we, we didn't understand because it seemed like you weren't a Democrat. Um, wait, it, it didn't understand because it seemed like you weren't really going for the, you know, same thing. And these are good, normal, ordinary, smart people who got this ballot, who are trying to understand and participate in democracy and couldn't quite figure out, you know, um, where to vote. So I think that and anecdotally, you know, that is, that indicates the kind of confusion that can happen just, you know, across the board. And so, you know, so I think that is really important. Um, for us all to understand, because at the end of the day, this is about democracy. This is about making sure that we make it as easy as possible for people to vote, which is the number one thing that we should be doing as, you know, as citizens. So, and I will also just say candidly, and, and folks who have known me for a while know this is true. Um, I was on the abolish line train before I decided to primary Josh. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll continue on that because I think at the base of it, it's just good government. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Lucy, Lucy Lettuce, you can lower, you can unmute yourself. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for your informative presentation and inspiring presentation. I'm not sure I heard you correctly but I thought I heard you use the word Antifa with reference to yourself. No? No. Okay. <laughs> then I don't have a question because I was going to say that's a little weird because of the negative connotations that it, that it has. And I know you're anti-fascist, but it wouldn't be a good choice of a label. Nope. I don't believe I said that. Okay. I misheard you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Uh, and the last um, hand I raise is for Elaine and Dan. Go ahead and unmute yourself. 
So we we actually had a, a pair of related questions. And uh, so mine is how do, to what extent, and if so, how does your background as a scientist inform your political commitment and activism? Um, and Elaine's question is, <laughs> Um, there, we have a speaker lined up in April from an organization called 3.14action.org. Yes, 3.14 as in pi. Um, and I'll just momentarily just read this. We're on a mission to elect more scientists to Congress, state legislatures, and local offices. As trained problem solvers, STEM professionals are ready, willing, and able to find solutions for the significant challenges facing America in the 21st century. So um, that's a tag to dance question and also a plug for, I think it's about April 15th, uh, the, a speaker from this organization. So anyway, your thoughts on your uh, background informing your campaign. Oh, that's fantastic that you have somebody from 314. Um, they actually don't uh, endorse in primaries. Um, ask me how I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately for, for some of us, um, but they're, they're a great org. Um, so it's 350.org um, in general. Um, how does it inform uh, my political? I mean, it, it, that, that's essentially why I, I ran for anything. Um, it's because I'm a scientist. Um, you know, I became a scientist because as, from a young age, I thought that was the way I was going to change the world, make the world a better place. Um, I had, you know, children have lofty goals, right? Um, and um, to me, when I first moved to New Jersey, this was, you know, like I said, eight and a half years ago, I was really surprised and appalled and shocked that there were no conversations about climate change. Um, you know, and it took something really small, like, um, you know, us uh, putting up a compost bin in the back, which when my husband and I lived in Philadelphia for 14 years, we had, you know, a compost bin in our, you know, very postage stamp little backyard. Um, and here, when I came to our community, this was just something like weird and wild and, and people really weren't talking about um, really the, the impact on climate change. In fact, I had neighbors who were saying climate change, you know, wasn't real. Um, and it was shocking to me. It was shocking to me as a human being. It was shocking to me as a scientist. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, what is going on here? Um, you know, where, where, where have I landed, especially with my two little kids in this like lovely, lovely community, right? Um, and so, you know, my activism actually stemmed from that, um, stemmed from this idea that, you know, I, I didn't understand why people weren't believing these truths that were there. Um, and, and to me, um, absolutely, I think the, the problem solving, all of that is true. It has been an asset in my political career. Um, but the, the driving force for why I decided to run as a council member was, was to do everything I could on a local um, basis to make sure that we are mitigating climate change. Um, because Trump became president, the world went crazy. Um, and to my horror upon horrors, um, you know, we were, we were just deleting things <laughs> related to the environment. Um, and having two kids and looking at them and trying to figure out what I would ever tell them as they got older um, and ask me what I had done. Um, you know, I thought, it clearly isn't enough that as a scientist, I'm talking about this in small ways. It's clearly I need to, you know, get to a point where I'm in a position of power to do something about it. Um, and I will just say that I'm so proud of the kinds of things that we've been able to do in Glenrock. Um, and it hasn't been solely because of me. It's been, again, a community of people who were committed um, and who ended up having somebody like me fighting for these things um, on the council. Um, and it hasn't been easy. Um, but at the end of the day, we went from you know, really not talking about things to um, climate change, just, you know, being part of what we write about on our website um, and, you know, part of our resolutions and part of why we make the kinds of decisions that we make, um, you know, both in the budget as well as otherwise with this, you know, fairly ambitious uh, renewable energy aggregation program. Um, that's the kind of thinking, right? And that's the kind of commitment we need from everybody, from all representatives that we have in power, whether you're on the board of ed, whether you are on a planning board, whether you are, you know, in a company, um, and especially, especially if you are in, you know, state and federal um, positions of power. Um, so I will say that 
it absolutely has influenced why I ran. Um, before this, uh, before this, before I became a council member, if you asked me, you know, what my greatest asset was, uh, you know, about being a scientist, I would have told you that it's because, oh gosh, I understand how to look at data. I understand, you know, how to do data analysis and all of that and problem solve. And I will say, yes, that is true. But what I've also discovered um, is the greatest asset is because as a scientist, you fail about a thousand times a day. Um, you just learn how to fail. And to me, the fact is I'm not afraid of failure because that's really what science is. You, you fail and then you do the experiment again and you try and do it better. And then if you get it right, you do it again. <laughs> And if you get it wrong, you do it again. Um, so it's failure and persistence. Um, so to me, I think that those have been the, the assets that, you know, that have really propelled me through the, the political portion of my career. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, then one more question. This is gonna be the last one because we have to go to announcements and that will be for Peter. You can unmute yourself. Good morning. Congratulations, Sarati. I'm a uh, longtime New Jersey native down here in the Southeast, South Carolina, and I did keep an eye on the race and very impressed that you were able to uh, garner over 30% of the vote despite being outspent, I think 10 to one. Um, my question is uh, about campaign finance reform. And now that you got to be in the inner workings, you got to see how it works. I remember my students and I actually wrote to the uh, state legislature and even to the national government where we had suggested that all candidates get the same amount of money. And it was a bit pie in the sky, I know, but all candidates dip into the pool. They get, they get a cap on the amount of money they can spend and just thought that would be the most fair solution. It just seems so ridiculous still, I mean, that uh, you can be outspent by that much. I mean, it's, and still get over 30%, that's amazing. But do you see any, um, any movement now that you've been through the process in campaign, for, like real movement, or is this just, is money always gonna run the show? Um, I think it depends on how much pressure we put it on. Um, and I would just say that, you know, 100%, it's about us educating folks uh, and it's about us making sure that uh, when we push forward, it, you know, Citizens United was one of the worst things to have happened to American politics. Um, and it continues to get worse and worse on both sides of the aisle. Um, and it's not, it's not a Democrat versus Republican. It's, it's up versus down for sure. Um, so it is up to us to push for this. I will say the folks making the greatest strides with this is our Sunrise. Um, and I think that um, they are, uh, they're amazing. Um, in the kinds of ways that they're bringing things to light. Um, I think that people are committed to making sure that we don't have this influence of you know, corporate PAC money um, in politics. Um, given the incredible multiple crises that we have, it's not going to change until we keep poking at it. Um, and frankly, it's not gonna change if we have Democrats who act the same way, because um, we have all three houses right now. Um, we have, you know, I mean, we have two houses in, in all three branches, sorry, of the government right now. Um, and I think we have a, frankly, a small window of time to make a lot happen. Um, COVID obviously has to come first, um, but there are a lot of chances to make real inroads um, into all of this. <laughs> And I think what is going to hamper us is the fear that uh, Democrats are inculcating the folks in power. Well, let me put it this way. The po folks in power are inculcating um, that in, you know, in two years, we're going to lose everything. And therefore, we need these corporate PAC donations to continue to keep our seats. Um, and that's frankly dangerous. So the more noise we can make about it, um, you know, the more progress that we can make about it. Um, that's where, that's where I come from. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, so this is really the last question because uh, Bet, yeah, there's someone in the Stein household would like to ask a question. So, Perry? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Arati. I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to thank you and to, uh, you know, to completely agree that I think that um, 
ballot design is really a kissing cousin to voter suppression. I think mm -hmm. they work hand in hand uh, directly. And I know that you were saying that as a scientist that you're, you're used to failure, uh, but I would also say to please think of your data analysis side of your head. Uh, you radically, dramatically overperformed uh, any expectation based upon the, the, I mean, having worked with the God Homily campaign before, I am, I am assuming that you knew exactly what you were getting into when you went into this in terms of uh, their monetary advantage uh, and their backing of being part of the machine. And uh, I think that you clearly overperformed. And I'd like to thank you and ask you to please take this opportunity to rest up, recharge, and please come back and uh, continue on. And thank you. Thank you. I very much appreciate that. Um, and I know that was the last question. I just want to address a couple of things um, in chat. There's a lot of talk about uh, incrementalism versus bull change. Um, there's some talk about sedition. There's some talk about compromise. Um, and there's some talk about, uh, you know, how and what words would you use. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that a couple of things. One, um, Lisa actually said what I wanted to say just sort of popped up on my thing. Um, not only is climate change real, it is an existential crisis. We have less than eight years to implement bold transformative policies to have a hint, a hint of mitigating the kind of disasters that we're going to have it. So let me be clear, they're going to be disasters. They're going to affect us. They are already affecting us on a day-to-day -day basis. They're affecting our food supply because where does our food supply come from? They're affecting energy, electricity. They're affecting the way we live. You think COVID is bad? Climate change is a worse disaster and it is coming down the pike. We don't have time to have small incremental changes. We have tried that for a very long time. We don't have time to act as if we don't have power, especially when we do in government. We don't have time to sit here and say things are going to happen on a glacial press, a glacial um, process that they've happened right now. We don't have time. We have time to make bold transformative change. What Ruth Bader Ginsburg was about was making sure that we have people together when we make that change. And guess what? We have the people. Most people want transformative change on climate change. Most people want equity. Most people want greater inclusion. And frankly, most people want Medicare for all. What is stopping us are people in power. What is stopping us is the status quo. So what we need are representatives who actually represent most of us. We don't have that time. And we don't have time to coddle middle-aged white men. We don't have time to coddle people in the status quo. Words absolutely matter. So do actions.